September 2nd, 1998, Swiss Air Flight 111, a McDonnell Douglas MD-11 with 229 people on board, is at cruising altitude on a flight between New York's JFK Airport and Geneva, Switzerland. About one hour into the flight, the captain and first officer think they smell smoke. The crew decides to land at a nearby airport and asks ATC to direct them to Boston, but ATC suggests Halifax since it's much closer. The crew lines up for a landing in Halifax, however, they are too high and need to shed altitude, dump fuel, and run their checklists. Suddenly, things get worse and the plane slams into the ocean 21 minutes after the smell of smoke was first detected. What caused the fire on board Swiss Air 111? Was there anything the crew could have done to land the plane? Find out on this episode of Black Box Down. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Black Box Down. It's Gus and Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello. We're here with another episode talking about Swiss Air Flight 111. I normally would have said 111. I just felt weird saying 111 and then McDonnell Douglas MD-11. Like 111, 111. <laughs> I don't know. I was just getting in my own head about it. Before we get started with the episode, as always, quick reminder, please follow us on social media at Black Box Down Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we post images and maps and things, the supplementary content that maybe help contextualize uh, what it is that we're talking about. And of course, you can check out some of our merch at store.roosterteeth.com by looking for Black Box Down. Got shirts, mugs, bumper sticker, all fine quality products. I'm drinking out of a Black Box Down mug right now, and it makes the coffee more delicious. I thought you were just going to end that sentence with, I'm drinking. I was like, Chris, are you okay? Is <laughs> there a <any> fine man? <laughs> But back to the incident at hand. Today, we're talking about Swiss Air Flight 111. Uh, It's an international passenger flight flying from New York City to Geneva, Switzerland, back on September 2nd, 1998. This was a a, a particularly popular flight with the United Nations since they have offices in New York and Geneva. So a lot Mm. of diplomats fly on this plane. The flight was crewed by Captain Urs Zimmerman, who was 50 years old with 10,800 hours. Uh, first officer, Stefan Lowe, who was 36 with 4,800 flight hours. Zimmerman sounds like a good name for a pilot. Yeah, good name. The aircraft used in this incident was a seven-year-old McDonnell Douglas MD-11 with over 36,000 hours. There were 215 passengers and 12 flight attendants on board as well. Uh, the MD-11, just for your own information, is a trijet. It's like a, a more updated version of the DC-10. So it's got okay. an engine under each wing and an engine in the vertical stabilizer as well. Just... So you can picture it in your head. Picture created. (laughs) Saving file. (laughs) The flight departed from New York at 12.18 a.m. UTC, which was 8.18 p.m. uh, New York time. Climbed up to 33,000 feet. And then just under an hour later at about 1.10 a.m. UTC, the pilot started to notice an unusual odor in the cockpit and began to investigate. The crew determined that the smell and smoke was related to the air conditioning system. So about four minutes later, they make a pan-pan transmission to air traffic control and reported that there was smoke in the cockpit and requested an immediate return to a convenient location. And like we mentioned before, pan-pan is below a mayday. It's like an emergency, but they're not immediately crashing. You know, they're not yeah. in danger of crashing right now. So just letting everyone know there's an emergency. We need to land uh, as soon as we can. The pilots actually requested to return to Boston, which was about 300 nautical miles behind them. Air traffic control cleared them to Boston and asked them to descend to 31,000 feet. At 1.15 a.m. UTC, the controller asked if Flight 111 would prefer to go to Halifax because it was closer. It was only about 56 nautical miles to their northeast. The crew expressed a preference for Halifax and they were cleared to fly directly to the Halifax airport. And then the two pilots put on their oxygen masks. It's speculated that maybe the captain asked for Boston because he was familiar with that airport. You know, he'd Mm. landed there a few times and he wasn't familiar with Halifax, even though Halifax was closer. Uh, Like I said, they're still out of Pan Pan, so... You know, maybe they were thinking about flying a little further to get to that familiar airport. But regardless, in the end, they actually end up diverting to Halifax instead. And I assume they put the oxygen masks on because of the smoke. Right. They got to be safe, right? They want to make sure they're not yeah. incapacitated or anything. So about a minute after this, the crew was instructed to descend to 10,000 feet. And then at 1.18 a.m., they were instructed to descend to 3,000 feet. But the pilots requested to stay at 8,000 feet until they were ready for landing. At 1.19, the controller instructed the crew to fly a 030 heading for a landing on runway 6. Then advised the crew they were 30 nautical miles away from the runway threshold. So at this point, the flight was still descending and was at an altitude of 21,000 feet. So the crew said they were going to need more than 30 nautical miles you know, to continue their descent to land. So the flight was instructed to fly a 360-degree heading, and the crew began to calculate their weight and agreed they were going to need to dump some fuel. 
At 121, the controller asked for the number of persons and the amount of fuel on board. The crew replied saying the aircraft had 230 tons of fuel on board and they needed to dump some fuel before landing. But that was actually a mistake. That was the current weight of the plane and not the amount of fuel. They're, so they're just a little distracted. So they're dumping fuel so that they land? So, like, what, why exactly? There's a maximum weight that they should land at just because there's a lot of pressures on the plane when it lands. You know, they're okay. coming down, the, the impact force on the gear, the ability for the brakes and the reverse thrusters to effectively stop the plane. If they're too heavy, it's too much mass to try to slow down on the runway. Okay. So they need to be under a certain weight. Yeah, they had all that fuel because they didn't fly to where right. they're supposed to. So, okay. Yeah, they're only an hour into a transatlantic flight. So they have way more fuel than uh, they need. So they got to get rid of that weight. So the controller asked if the pilots could turn to the south to dump that fuel or if they preferred to stay near the airport. The pilots said they would be able to fly south, so they were instructed to fly a 200-degree heading and advised when they were ready to begin the fuel dump. The controller then advised they were about 10 nautical miles from the coast, but still within 25 nautical miles of the airport, and the crew indicated they were descending to 10,000 feet for the fuel dump. At 1.21, the controller instructed the flight to a heading of 180 degrees and told the crew they had about 15 nautical miles until they reached the coast. The crew acknowledged this, and they were advised they were at 10,000 feet. The controller then notified the aircraft they would be about a 25 to 40 nautical miles away from the airport in case they needed to get back in a hurry. So they're being, you know, directed away from the airport a little bit to dump their fuel, but they're still really close to it. If they need to, then get back very quickly, 25 to 40 miles. Are they trying to dump the fuel in the ocean or? Right. They're off the coast of Halifax and they're doing their fuel dump out there. Okay. The pilot said, you know, this was fine and they asked to be notified when they could start dumping. 20 seconds after that, the pilots informed the controller they had to fly manually and asked for clearance between 11,000 and 9,000 feet. The controller replied saying they were clear to fly any altitude between five and 12,000 feet and about 20 seconds later, both pilots almost simultaneously declare an emergency, which the controller acknowledged. They said they started to dump fuel and they needed to land immediately. Because at this point, they began to lose electrical power. They were using flashlights in the cabin to try to continue their landing prep. The controller indicated he would get back to them in just a couple of minutes, which the crew acknowledged. And about 20 seconds later, the crew again declared an emergency, which the controller acknowledged. The controller cleared them to dump fuel and there was no response. Oh no. Yeah, the controller repeated the clearance and there was no further communication between Flight 111 and the controller. Uh, at about 1.30, observers in the area of St. Margaret's Bay, Nova Scotia, saw a large aircraft fly overhead at a low altitude and heard the sounds of its engines. And about a minute later, several observers heard a sound described as a loud clap. Seismographs in the area recorded in Halifax and Moncton a seismic event at 1.31.18 UTC, which is the time that the aircraft struck the water. The aircraft was destroyed by the impact and there were no survivors. The accident occurred in the hours of darkness, and the center of the debris field was on the ocean floor at a depth of about 180 feet. So it hit the ocean real hard. It did. Uh, I believe I uh, read that the impact forces were the equivalent of 350 G when it hit oh, the water. God. Yeah, which would be incredibly hard. Uh, the aircraft pretty much disintegrated when it hit the water. They went down hard then. Yeah. So then, I mean, it, it seems like it's one of those things where things escalated very quickly, right? They smell mm -hmm. smoke, you know, it seems like everything's calm. They're going through their process, their procedure. Then they're like, oh, we're flying manually. We need to land. And then they crash. Oh, so, yeah, the situation went out of control very quickly for them. And they didn't communicate what changed. Well, I think they reported that, you know, they had lost their electrical power. And that, that's when they said they were having to fly manually. Mm. So the investigation was carried out by the Transportation Safety Board of Canada. And when they began to examine the piece of debris that they collected, they noticed that there was fire damage. They began to think that an in-flight fire is what led to the crash, and to get a better understanding of what happened, they rebuilt the front 33 feet of the aircraft, which was from the cockpit to near the front of the first-class passenger cabin. Because they determined that this was the area the fire started in, so they want to really focus on that. Several wires in this area were found with evidence of arcing, and after examining them, it was determined that all of the arcs were caused by fire damage except for one. Hmm. One of the wires for the in-flight entertainment system could not be attributed to fire-related damage. This arc would have occurred just forward of manufacturing station 383, which is located above the right rear cockpit ceiling. So kind of behind where the first officer sits above that position in the ceiling. Investigators think that an arcing event in this area would have had potential to ignite the metallicized polyethylene terapha... Ugh, I've been dreading this episode for this word. I'm going to practice <laughs> Please it. leave that in. Please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Investigators think that an arcing event in this area would have the potential to ignite the metallized polyethylene terephthalate, which was the insulation blankets. 
That's a huge mouthful. Um, I'm going to have to say it a few more times in this episode, so I'm going to practice right now. Metallized polyethylene terephthalate. We're just going to call it MPET going forward. <laughs> the MPET, the metallized polyethylene terephthalate. So it was um, insulation blankets, and they think that it may have been ignited by the arcing event. Okay. So ignition of these insulation blankets would produce a small amount of smoke with a relatively strong odor. Mm. Right. And like I said, they smelled it right away before they, they saw the smoke. A small flame front would then pass over the cockpit rear wall and ignite foam material used around conduits and wire runs along with more MPET material. So it's likely that a small propagating flame front breached the exposed galley 2 silicone uh, elastomeric vent cap, which is located next to the cockpit rear wall. Air would immediately be drawn through the breached opening into the galley vent duct assembly as soon as the vent cap was penetrated. So you know, the fire approaches this vent cap, breaches it, which then sucks in more air which starts feeding the fire. Oh, yeah. Yeah, initially, the airflow would likely extinguish the small propagating flame front in the area immediately adjacent to the vent cap. But in this case, investigators think that the flame propagation would also be taking place elsewhere, since by the time that the vent cap was ignited, mm. the flames would have spread over a much larger area, including the riser duct assembly. So air rushes in, you know, maybe puts out that initial bit of fire right by it, but the fire is also spread to other places, and this air is starting to feed it. Mm. Once the fire intensified in the riser duct area and propagated onto the right fuselage sidewall, the vent cap likely would have been reignited or melted, resulting in a failure of the vent cap. This would create a larger opening and a much larger draw of air into the vent duct system. The draw of air into the vent duct system could have delayed the return of smoke and odor into the cockpit and delayed the early detection of the fire in the passenger cabin. So the air goes in, you know, starts kind of rushing in, there's more air, it kind of maybe blows the odor away from the cockpit for a little while which delays them from smelling it or acting on it. You think they might have smelled it at first and then it went away? Yeah, I think from reading the timeline, it seems like they initially smell it. They can't identify what it is. It goes away, and then four minutes later, they start to see smoke. Mm, okay. So, yeah, they, they definitely knew that something was going on, but weren't sure what. And they got, there was like a, that little four-minute delay may have, uh, may have cost them here. Yeah. The vertical airspaces adjacent to the center riser duct and between the aft side of the aft riser duct and the forward side of the R1 door frame would channel hot combustion byproducts and create a chimney plume effect that would produce concentrated heat in areas above these spaces. So basically, it's like a chimney. All the hot air and you know any debris that's burning would be getting pushed through by this chimney plume effect. And this plume effect would be further promoted by the vertical walled-in confinement of the MPET insulated lower section of the riser duct assembly. Evidence of a high temperature chimney plume effect was apparent in the wreckage that corresponded to these locations. And some of the damage found was consistent with a temperature exposure of 593 degrees Celsius, which is almost 1100 degrees Fahrenheit for a duration of 10 minutes. So it was really, really hot in there mm -hmm. because of this chimney plume. It was being directed maybe away from the cockpit, which made it a little more difficult for them to detect. Yeah. The fire eventually then breached the silicone elastomeric end cap in a short branch stub on an air conditioning duct located immediately aft and overhead the cockpit door. This would have allowed a large volume of conditioned air to enter the area and augment the fire. Damage observed in this area shows evidence of a rapidly accelerated fire. The fire would have then spread above the cockpit door using MPET insulation materials as fuel for the fire. The fire then started to cause malfunctions in the aircraft system like the autopilot, Radio and electrical systems were also damaged, and the CVR and FDR stopped recording five minutes and 37 seconds before the plane impacted the water. So yeah, you know, mm. the fire, we've talked about this before, you know, all these electrical problems, this, the sign of a fire that's out of control. Mm -hmm. Eventually, molten aluminum began to drip from the area above the right observer seat. Uh, aluminum deposits were found on the seat and the lap belt. Oh my God, was someone sitting there? The molten aluminum is falling on the right observer seat, which is a seat in the MD-11 right behind the first officer. So it's really close to the first officer, but it's behind him. And at this time, we only, as far as I remember, there's only the captain and the first officer in the cockpit. So there wouldn't have been anyone sitting in there, but it's still really close. Getting molten aluminum dripped on you, not be a good way to... Uh... No, I imagine it would be incredibly uh, painful. But that's just a testament to how hot it is, right? Yeah. Just aluminum is melting and, and dripping. So the investigators believe the fire was likely caused by arcing, but they were not able to determine the exact origin of the arc. No determination could be made regarding how the insulation at the Ford arc location was initially breached or what that wire came into contact with, like 
you know, was it the structure of the plane, another wire? Like, what caused the arc itself? Arcing is, and it's just electricity jumping off the wire. Right, going to a, somewhere else, another wire or a piece of metal or something. Although the available information indicates that the forward arcing event occurred during the time of the fire initiating event and in the area where the fire most likely originated, it cannot be concluded that the forward arc was on the lead arcing event. So they're just trying to, you know, they're trying to say that they're fairly confident about this, but they can't determine the exact source. Mm -hmm. It appears likely that at least one other wire was involved in the lead arcing event. However, it could not be determined whether this was an in-flight entertainment system wire or wires, one or more aircraft wires, or some combination of both. An arcing event or events provided an ignition source for the fire. However, this arcing would not have resulted in a threat to the aircraft had there not been material nearby that could easily be ignited, such as an ignition source. So again, they're saying an arcing event is bad, but it shouldn't cause a fire, but there just happened to be ignition sources nearby that could burn that fed the fire. Mm -hmm. And it was the presence of significant amount of flammable materials that allowed the fire to spread and intensify rapidly, which ultimately led to the loss of control of the aircraft. Testing during the investigation showed that several materials located in the area were flammable, especially the MPET covering material on the insulation blankets. I like to use the acronym now. <laughs> yeah, MPET. I'm not, I, I, I can't keep saying that. Metallized polyethylene terephthalate. It's a word that's not meant to be said. So. No. There's a PH and a TH back to back in that. Terephthalate. Yeah. So the investigators say that the most significant deficiency in the chain of events that resulted in this crash was the presence of flammable material that allowed the fire to ignite and propagate, which makes sense. Yeah, because insulation, I've been, I've been doing looking into insulation recently, and it's not supposed to be flammable. <laughs> like, Yeah, you wouldn't think it would be. Like, it's supposed to be flame resistant because it's like, otherwise, everything burns down. Right. I'm trying to picture what this looks like, right? And I think in my mind what this is, is the MPET is not necessarily the insulation itself. It's like a, a protective blanket that's covering the insulation. Protective blanket that's flammable. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, a metallic, kind of like a, like a mylar balloon, like a shiny, thin mm -hmm. metal. Okay. But it's like kind of plasticky almost. I think that's a very similar composition that we're dealing with here. Like a metallized version of that. Okay. So the certification testing procedures mandated under flammability standards that existed at the time of the occurrence were not sufficiently stringent or comprehensive to adequately represent the full range of potential ignition sources, nor did the testing procedures replicate the behavior of the materials when installed in combination or in various locations and orientations as they are found in typical aircraft installations and realistic operating environments. The lack of adequate standards allowed materials to be approved for use in aircraft even though they could be ignited and propagate flames. Two primary factors shaped the flammability standards in place at the time of the occurrence. So this is answering the question you asked, like, why would they put something flammable in there? It doesn't make uh -huh. any sense. So I'm going to read over the two factors that shaped these uh, standards at the time. The approach taken by the FAA in the mid-1970s to concentrate its fire prevention efforts in the following two areas. Improved cabin interior materials and higher standards for materials in designated fire zones. That was number one. Number two. A lower priority assigned to fire threats in other areas. The non-fire zone hidden areas were viewed as benign from a fire hazard perspective as they were seen to be free of the combination of the two elements needed for a fire, a potential ignition source and flammable materials. So they were kind of the opinion of like out of sight, out of mind. Like we're going to mm -hmm. focus on areas that we think are more pressing and more probable to start fires. And these other areas, that's not likely there's going to be a fire there. Yeah. So most aircraft crew are likely unaware that under certain conditions, a fire could ignite significant flammable materials in hidden areas of the aircraft and spread rapidly, like what happened here. Yeah. You know, had the pilots been aware that flammable material were present in the attic space of the MD-11, this knowledge might have affected their evaluation of the source of the odor and the smoke. Yeah, because they thought it was the AC. Well, they thought it was coming through the air conditioner or something else. If they knew, hey, there's flammable material everywhere above our head, they might have been like, oh, we better declare a matey and get down a lot more quickly. It's 2021, which means there are so many new ways to diversify your portfolio. You've got stocks, bonds, mutual funds, maybe some Dogecoin you bought as a joke. But what about private real estate? Studies have shown that portfolios that include private real estate generally deliver a better risk adjustment return with more annual income and lower volatility. With Fundrise, you can now get into investing in private real estate because they provide access to all investors on an easy-to-use platform. Whether you're looking to add stable cash flow or long-term growth, Fundrise makes investing in private real estate as easy as investing in stocks, bonds, or mutual funds. Fundrise's team of real estate professionals carefully vets and actively manages their real estate projects. 
You can track your portfolio's performance and watch as properties across the country are acquired, improved, and operated via dynamic asset updates. So see for yourself how 150,000 investors have built a better portfolio with private real estate. It takes just a few minutes to get started. Go to fundrise.com slash blackbox down today. That's F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash blackbox down. Fundrise.com slash blackbox down. You're about to hear a preview of the Jordan Harbinger show with the world's best counterfeiter. How long does it take to print $250 million? Five months. It needs to be worthwhile. It's going to need to be perfect. 12,500 kilos or over eight Toyota Camrys or six Ford F-150s. That is multiple metric sh- tons of cash. You must have been f-ing stoked, man, because you knew you were going to put $20 bills all over all of that and then just never work again. Yes. By design, there are people specifically looking for you all the time. This is all they do. You can tell them whatever you want. They're not dummies. I mean, this is as high as it goes. This is top of the line. For more on how Frank Barassa printed his own fortune and got away with it, check out episode 488 on The Jordan Harbinger Show, anywhere you get your podcasts. So there's some findings as to causes and contributing factors. One of these that I'm going to read, I'm going to spend a little extra time talking on because um, it's very likely that one of these was the reason that the fire started. But I'll, I'll focus on that here in just a bit. Aircraft certification standards for material flammability were inadequate in that they allowed the use of materials that could be ignited and sustain or propagate fire. Consequently, flammable material propagated a fire that started above the ceiling on the right side of the cockpit near the cockpit rear wall. The fire spread and intensified rapidly to the extent that it degraded aircraft systems in the cockpit environment and ultimately led to the loss of control of the aircraft. Metallized polyethylene teraf... I tried to say it again. I tried. (laughs) Metallized polyethylene terephthalate uh, type cover material on the thermal acoustic installation blankets used in the aircraft were flammable. The cover material was most likely the first material to ignite and constituted the largest portion of the combustible materials that contributed to the propagation intensity of the fire. So again, they're just reemphasizing mm-hmm. it was these MPET blankets. Once ignited, other types of thermal acoustic insulation cover materials exhibit flame propagation characteristics similar to MPET covered insulation blankets and do not meet the proposed revised flammability test criteria. Metallized polyvinyl fluoride type cover material was installed in the aircraft and was involved in the in-flight fire. Silicone elastomeric end caps, hook and loop fasteners, foams, adhesives, and thermal acoustic insulation splicing tapes contributed to the propagation and intensity of the fire. So it's kind of going through all of the things that ignited and could have made this worse. Yeah. The type of circuit breakers used in the aircraft were similar to those in general aircraft use and were not capable of protecting against all types of wire arcing events. The fire most likely started from a wire arcing event. The circuit breakers were just normal circuit breakers like in the rest of the aircraft? Like other ones used in general aircraft use. So they they didn't trip in the event of the arc. Oh, okay. The arc continued, you know, may have happened a few times and then that's how fire started. Okay, I didn't know that they could like shut off with arcing. Well, I think like if you overload a circuit, right, then the breaker might flip. Okay. That's my understanding. I'm not an electrician. <laughs> There's many things <laughs> I'm not. Electrician is not one of them. But I think in my head, that picture, that's how it would work. Okay. Um, this next one, I think, is maybe the most interesting. We're going to talk about this a bit. A segment of in-flight entertainment network power supply unit cable exhibited a region of resolidified copper on one wire that was caused by an arcing event. This resolidified copper was determined to be located near manufacturing station 383, which I mentioned earlier in the area where the fire most likely originated. This arc was likely associated with the fire initiation event. However, it could not be determined whether this arc wire was the lead event. So they have a strong suspicion that this is what started the fire. They can't say 100% Mm -hmm. definitively, but they said this is most likely where it started. And it was a power cable for the in-flight entertainment network. Remember, this was September 1998. And Swiss Air had just installed new in-flight entertainment for their business class and first class passengers. At the time, it was pretty high-tech stuff. It allowed them to, you know, watch movies on demand, make phone calls, and they could browse the internet. Oh, wow. In 1998? Wow. Yeah, September 1998. This was really, really advanced for the time. So these were brand new in-flight entertainment systems that had just been installed in, you know, these cabins. And it's suspected that it's probably these systems that had the arc that led to the fire. And they said there was, like, a piece of copper that kind of, like, melted up? It had re-solidified, so it had melted and then become hard. Oh, okay. 
In fact, the in-flight entertainment system on this plane had been installed in the business class cabin one year before the incident, and it was installed in first class in February, so seven months before the incident. So it was still, like I said, it was still really new at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyway, I just thought that was uh, interesting to touch on, especially considering how high-tech it was for 1998, and ultimately, you know, it did probably lead to this incident. Could it be a thing where it's like that area of the plane wasn't used to having those types of wires, or it didn't fit? correctly it was like added after the fact yeah i mean it's possible but i mean i think most in-flight entertainment systems like this are added after the plane leaves the manufacturer you know, uh-huh. the airline installs that not oh, okay the manufacturer yeah. so you know maybe it was a learning process for whoever installed it. i don't i can't i don't know specifically i can't speak to that but yeah that's definitely a, a possibility there was a reliance on sight and smell to detect and differentiate between odor or smoke from different potential sources This reliance resulted in the misidentification of the initial odor and smoke as originating from an air conditioning source, which is something you mentioned earlier. There was no integrated in-flight firefighting plan in place for the accident aircraft, nor was there a plan required by regulation. Therefore, the aircraft crew did not have procedures or training directing them to aggressively attempt to locate and eliminate the source of the smoke and to expedite their preparations for a possible emergency landing. In the absence of such a firefighting plan, they concentrated on preparing the aircraft for the diversion landing. So again, they just didn't treat it as aggressively as they should have, as aggressively as it would be treated nowadays. You know, regulations Mm -hmm, changed. mm -hmm. In fact, I read a little bit of trivia about this, that for the situation they were going through, the checklist that they would have to go through in order to land, once they determined this was what they were going to do, just running through the checklist alone would take between 20 and 30 minutes. Whoa. So obviously it's way too long for an emergency like this. Yeah. We're going to talk about this down the road, but one of the things that changed because this is optimization of these checklists yeah that one flight that we talked about that had the fire in the cargo bin the value jet yeah when was that so the value jet incident you're talking about where the oxygen generators ignited in the cargo hold that was in may of 1996 so about two years before this incident okay so fires were a problem in the 90s yeah definitely and you know we like we talked about on that one that was because it was in a sealed off cargo hold with no oxygen, but it was oxygen generators in there, so they were feeding the fire. So normally a fire wouldn't have been a problem in there, but it was. So two different reasons for fires that bring down a plane, but still, in the end, you know, these are avoidable accidents. Neither they should have crashed. So the next, uh, next one here, there is no requirement that a fire-induced failure be considered when completing the system safety analysis required for certification. The fire-related failure of silicone elastomeric end caps installed on air conditioning ducts resulted in the addition of a continuous supply of conditioned air that contributed to the propagation and intensity of the fire. The loss of primary flight displays and lack of outside visual references forced the pilots to be reliant on the standby instruments for at least some portion of the last minutes of the flight. In the deteriorating cockpit environment, the positioning and small size of these instruments would have made it difficult for the pilots to transition to their use and to continue to maintain the proper spatial orientation of the aircraft. So like I said, you know, they had to bust out flashlights and use backup instruments because they lost their electrical power. Yeah, that's, that's rough. In the last minutes of the flight, the electronic navigation equipment and communication radio stopped operating, leaving the pilots with no accurate means of establishing their geographic position, navigating to the airport, and communicating with air traffic control. Examination of several MD-11 aircraft revealed various wiring discrepancies that had the potential to result in wire arcing. Other agencies have found similar discrepancies in other aircraft types. Such discrepancies reflect a shortfall within the aviation industry in wire installation, maintenance, and inspection procedures. This is a really big deal. I feel like we've talked Mm -hmm. about this a couple of times, like how wires are run through a plane and the need for them to be separated. We've talked about this, like high voltage arcing to low voltage lines. And, you know, we've talked about numerous (laughs) ways that this can go wrong. And then the last one here, actions by the flight crew in preparing the aircraft for landing, including their decisions to have the passenger cabin ready for landing and to dump fuel, were consistent with being unaware that an onboard fire was propagating. So there was some action taken uh, by the time that the report for this was published. Uh, The team inspected several MD-11 aircraft in order to identify potential areas of arcing or sources of heat generation. These inspections yielded wiring discrepancies that included chafed, cut, and cracked wires, which you don't want. Inconsistencies in wire and wire bundle routing were also discovered, which raised concerns about the overall integrity of the MD-11's wiring system. While the investigation team could not establish a direct relationship between the in-service wiring discrepancies and the wires recovered in the Swiss Air Flight 111 wreckage, the team felt that the data warranted a wider review to better define the risk to the MD-11 fleet. 
The Transportation Safety Bureau sent an aviation safety advisory to the NTSB about the wiring issues. The NTSB recommended that the FAA require an inspection of all MD-11 for wiring discrepancies. This inspection concentrated in and around the cockpit overhead circuit breaker panel and the avionics circuit breaker panel. The inspection should also include examinations for loose wire connections, inconsistent wire routing, broken bonding wires, small wire bend radii, and chafed or cracked wire insulation. So basically they're just saying, we got to go through all the MD-11, so we got to look at yeah. that. You know, we got to make sure that the wires are are good. And not just the ones with entertainment systems installed, like just all of them. Right. The MD-11, uh, in its lifetime, between the time it was built, between 1988 and 2000, only about 200 of them were ever built. So it's a daunting task, but it's not like there's thousands you have to go through. Mm-hmm. The FAA launched a two-phase MD-11 wiring corrective action plan. The first phase consisted of three airworthiness directives that focused on the areas of concern highlighted in the TSB safety advisory. Subsequently, the FAA, working closely with Boeing, launched the second phase, which consisted of five corrective action packages, each comprising of a series of airworthiness directives. Each airworthiness directive was based on a Boeing-generated MD-11 service bulletin. And as of May 10, 2002, the MD-11 wiring corrective action plan yielded 41 related airworthiness directives with additional service bulletins undergoing notice of proposed rulemaking review. So they're just highlighting. They went through all these planes, figured out what needed to be done, and they you know, went through the process of correcting them all. And the reason I mentioned Boeing there is, you know, like I said, it's the MD-11 because it was manufactured by McDonnell Douglas. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Boeing acquired that in 1997. They acquired that arm of McDonnell Douglas. So they inherited all okay. of the MD-designated aircraft. The FAA responded to the TSB recommendation uh, the proposed removal of MPET covered insulation blankets from all U.S. registered aircraft. The final okay. rule regarding these proposals, yeah, came about in May 2000 when the FAA issued two ADs which required the removal of all MPET covered insulation blankets. And I want to say, I'm going off the top of my head here, I want to say they completed that in 2005. So as of 2005, like that material is no longer allowed in planes. Good. Something positive came out of it. Mm-hmm. Both the FAA and Transport Canada concurred with the TSB's position with respect to in-flight firefighting and have advised that a review of existing programs is underway. Upon completion of the review, both regulators, in conjunction with the joint aviation authorities, will take a harmonized approach to improving in-flight firefighting systems. And as of March 2002, the program review involved the following activities. Developing fire tests for materials in inaccessible areas. Developing the most effective means to gain access to hidden areas for the firefighting purposes. Determining the feasibility of fire detection and suppression systems in inaccessible areas. Exploring the feasibility of water spray and nitrogen suppression systems. Developing improved fire smoke detection systems. Developing ultra-fire resistant interior materials. Enhancing tools to allow for accurate risk assessment of aircraft wiring system threats. Developing new circuit breaker technology to prevent the harmful effects of arcing and arc tracking. Developing certification criteria for new fire detector sensor technology. So all of these are great. All of them really focusing on... Mm -hmm detecting and fighting fire, especially in areas where they aren't accessible, they can't readily see. Yeah. I think a long time ago in an early episode, we talked about the fire axe and we explained you know, what the purpose was. You need to cut open the wall if you need to, to be able to, to yeah. find where the fire is behind a wall to be able to you know, fight it. Make it easier to get to. Yeah. It's a weird thing to think about. What if they're like, we need to make these walls designed to break? If you hit most things with an axe, you can get through it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. If you're determined enough and the axe is sharp enough, you can do just about anything. So in September of 1999, Swiss Air, Delta, and Boeing agreed to share liability for the accident and offered the families of the passengers financial compensation. So you may you heard I mentioned Delta in there. It was a code share flight with Delta Airlines. That's probably the only reason that they're thrown in there as well. So the offer that they made to the passengers for this financial compensation was actually rejected in favor of a lawsuit, they filed a $19.8 billion lawsuit against Swiss Air and DuPont. And DuPont, of course, was the maker of the Mylar insulation sheathing. Wow. However, a U.S. federal court ruled against punitive damages in February 2002, and the resulting compensation totaled over $13 million. So not quite the $19.8 billion that they were being sued for, but... Quite less, actually. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit less. A non-denominational memorial service was held on the grounds of East St. Margaret's Elementary School in Indian Harbor on September 9th, 1998. Among those in attendance were the 175 relatives of the crash victims, Swiss President Flavio Coti, Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, and Nova Scotia Premier Russell McClellan. A memorial service was also held in Zurich on the 11th of September, 1998. 
And the following year, another memorial was held in Nova Scotia. Two memorials to those who died in the crash were established by the government of Nova Scotia. One is to the east of the crash site at the Whale's Back, which is a promontory one kilometer north of Peggy's Cove. The second is a more private but much larger commemoration located west of the crash site near Bayswater Beach Provincial Park on the Aspatogan Peninsula in Bayswater. Here, the unidentified remains of the victims are interred. A fund was established to maintain the memorials and the government passed an act to recognize the memorials. Various other charitable funds were also created, including one in the name of a young victim from Louisiana, Robert Martin Milet, which provided money for children in need, and one in the name of Robert's mother, Karen E. Milet Dominique, who was also a victim, which uh, grants scholarships. A further permanent memorial, which is not publicly accessible, was created inside the operations center at Zurich Airport, where a simple plaque on the ground floor in the center opening of a spiral staircase pays tribute to the victims. In the late 1990s, the McDonnell Douglas MD-11 was the only and last trijet airliner in production. At the time of the accident, Boeing was still producing the freighter version, but it ceased production of the passenger version, the last of those being delivered to Sabena in 1998. So like I said, there were never a ton of these that were made. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, even by this point, it was already kind of being phased out. This particular crash for Flight 111 was a severe blow to Swiss Air, particularly as the in-flight entertainment system that was blamed for causing the accident had been installed in the aircraft to attract more passengers because <laughs> yeah. they were having financial difficulties. So this was like part of their plan to try to attract customers and it didn't go right. Swiss Air actually went bankrupt shortly after September 11th attacks in 2001. You know, and that event really caused a lot of disruption in the aviation industry and Swiss Air went under as a result of it. Also a little bit of um, an interesting footnote Two paintings by Pablo Picasso were on board and were destroyed in the accident. Whoa. Yeah, uh, and that's about it for Swiss Air Flight 111. A flight where there was an onboard fire and the crew detected it and there was actually enough time for them to get the plane on the ground, but just for a combination of reasons, they, they didn't make it. You know, there was, if they had expedited, they could have landed in Halifax. Mm -hmm. You know, they were maybe a little high. If they'd come in a little, it, it's all armchair you know, piloting yeah. though, right? It's like saying, oh, they should have come in faster, they should have come in lower, they should have, you know, not worried about dumping their fuel so much, but they're going by their checklist, their really long checklist also. And, you know, they just didn't realize how dire of a situation they were in until it was too late. Yeah, just not being aware of the fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of things worked against them. I think also, you know, when, you know, we didn't get into all of the nitty gritty with it, but when they were preparing for this, you know, emergency landing, they cut off power to the main passenger cabin as like part of their checklist. And this also, you know, helped propagate the fire further because it it slowed down the air circulation going out to the passenger cabin and concentrated it more back up in the cockpit, which fed the oh. fire more and caused it to accelerate more. It was like all these little things that just add mm. up to, you know, running out of time. And I think when they were circling, there was one point where they get really, you know, when I mentioned they were really close to Halifax Airport, they were only 30 miles away, but they had too much altitude. And they turn out to try to shed altitude and dump fuel. Man, it's it's... It's hard to say. They were definitely too heavy to land immediately, but it's all, all about managing your risk, I guess. Yeah, it'd been probably better to have broken the, the landing wheels or something. Yeah, but you never know. That, that could also cause a, a much worse accident. That's true. You know, they were being cautious. They thought they were following the procedure the way it should have been. They were following procedure the way it should have been. It's just the procedures were inadequate. But, you know, a lot has changed. A lot has gotten better as a result of it. But that's it for this episode. Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening. Thank everyone for your support. Uh, don't forget to give us a follow on social media. Check out our merch at store.roosterteeth.com. I looked up the polyurethane metaphethylate. <laughs> uh, it's it's like the same stuff as that's used in like um, those uh, uh, emergency blankets and stuff like oh, that. Like, yeah, like a space blanket. Yeah, because it's a you know heat radiator. You know, put, pushes the energy in or out. You know, or from spreading out yeah like those shiny blankets is what you're talking about yeah uh yeah you can look it up uh i'll see if i can post an image on social media uh so people can also get an idea for what we're talking about and then they can also get a chance to read it and try and pronounce it they can do the black box down challenge uh <laughs> you can try to pronounce it and uh, tell us the show us your best way of pronouncing it yeah all right thanks for listening everybody bye, bye.